Next speaker is Helen Kent. Helen is the founder and owner of Progressive Medical in Carlsbad here in the San Diego area. The focus of her organization is caring for clients, patients with issues related to sleep disordered breathing. Helen has over 35 years of experience and it looks like about two minutes of experience putting on a <laughs> lavalier microphone. <laughs> uh, she has been in the business uh, since the early 80s um, and has worked extensively with neuromuscular patients uh, and dealing specifically with their sleep disordered breathing issues. Helen, thank you for attending and the lectern is yours. Thank you. I want to let you know that it's very easy to come up here and talk and speak after your presentation. You, you said everything I wanted to say and more. Thank you. <laughs> it, was, it was a real pleasure. Um, do you want to come to San Diego? Would you like a job? <laughs> we could sure use you. Um, how many respiratory therapists do we have in the crowd? Raise those hands up. Come on, kids. Oh, good. Okay, my goal here today is to help you understand how to take care of a neuromuscular patient. And I think that community has been very, very ignored. Um, I can say as I went to school, I was never, or I, I shouldn't say, we were, were given very little information about the neuromuscular patient. And we were, all, we were always instructed about the obstructive patient, the COPD, the asthma, uh, the chronic bronchitic, that kind of thing. But you people, you were ignored. And that's a huge community. Um, somehow I got around to seeing you through sleep studies. Um, I was very early on with sleep studies, and I saw that you guys were different. You, your breathing pattern was different. You actually slept different. Everything about you was different. So the more I saw of you, the more I realized that you were not the average Joe, and there was different ways of treating you. So what happened is that um, it, it's a growth process. It's been a growth process because it wasn't taught in school, and we are still growing. And everything that we just said about studying you people is absolutely the truth. And I'm going to help show you guys how to test these patients. I hope. Okay. Is which one do I push here? One on the right. Another. This one here. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Here. There. There you are. You're. Um, you're actually tired during the day, all day long. Okay. This is what I want you to take away from this presentation. What tests are needed to qualify for ventilatory support and for the neuromuscular patient? That's really important. How and when to perform these uh, tests? What sleep labs miss? And I want you to pay attention to this because sleep labs miss a lot when you go in there for a sleep study. Um, proper equipment selection for the neuromuscular patient. I hope we don't have any sleep lab people here. Do, do, do we? Oh, okay. Well, I, this is an education for you, too. I really want you to see this, because you get a lot of these people in your lab, and I'm, I'm going to sh actually show you a drawing of one of a, a, po a post-polio patient who went into a sleep lab and came out with a CPAP, and that is my worst fear. Okay. Um, these are some of the acronyms that I put together on a piece of paper. I think all of you have that. I know Dr. Bendit referred to a lot of them, but this will help explain what they are. If I say something that's not on there, can you please make a note of it, and I'll try and tell you what it is. Um, okay. Respiratory weakness with the neuromuscular patients is very noticeable with sleep. That's the first time that people really notice it, usually, particularly during REM. And REM is rapid eye movement, or the deepest sleep that we can get into. And that is the most important sleep that we can get into, if you don't know that. That's where we repair all of our bodies. That's where dreams take place. And that's where we're actually uh, basically paralyzed. And I was always told that's because you don't want to act out your dreams. So some of our dreams are pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> um, during REM sleep, intercostal and accessory muscles are flaccid, so they can't help the diaphragm. So there's another reason why you uh, breathe more shallow during REM sleep. And also the postural disadvantage. In other words, when you're lying down in a supine position, you are at a disadvantage of about 30%. So if you were standing up and we did testing on you, you they are much weaker when you're lying down, about 30% less. 
And of course, what happens? You get hypoventilation. That means decreased ventilation. Hypoxemia, and that means low oxygen in the blood. And hypercarb, hypercapnia, high carbon dioxide levels in the blood. OK, here's the tracing that I talked to you about. This came from an actual study. This is a post-polio patient. And basically, um, you can see here, let's see if I can do this right. Whoops, wrong one. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not used to pointers. This is a light saber. Oh, cool. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Watch out. <laughs> OK, this here is the airflow channel right here. This has been pieced together. We actually have this in our office. We have several of these in our office to show you uh, visually how people breathe. The difference between a person that has obstructive sleep apnea and a person that has neuromuscular disease. This is the respiratory effort, the chest belt right here. And this is the um, abdominal belt. OK, now you can see these are really small movements, right? OK, over here, these, these are, this is stage two of a sleep study. Over here is REM, right there. See that REM part? OK, now see what happens in REM? They're breathing shallowly here, but look at what happens here. There's no air movement, or hardly any. And this is what your labs will say is hypopnea or apnea, OK? And this here, you can see there's very little effort here, very little effort. Remember what Dr. Bennett said about REM sleep? This all kind of ties together. Um, so when you guys come out, can you see where there's no breathing here? No airflow or hardly any. Then you have a snort here. OK, look what's happening to the oxygen. Here's your oxygen level. It's going down severely. What's it say over here? 73%. So th that's, this is what uh, the sleep labs miss. So when you go into a sleep lab and they see that, they say, oh my goodness, that person needs a CPAP. And so you come out with your CPAP. Um, this is what it's, the little saying that was down below on the bottom of that sleep tracing. Hypoventilation, it, it showed you hypoventilation in REM sleep caused by loss of accessory muscle use in a post-polio patient. That tracing showed the onset of REM sleep in the post-polio patient as REM-related muscle atonia set in. The patient lost, loses the ability to use her accessory muscles for breathing. That recording segment showed a progressive pattern of REM-related hypoventilation with subsequent hypoxemia. Following a diagnostic study, this patient should be treated with NPPB, non-invasive ventilation, or an EO471, not a BiPAP. We don't say BiPAP. Okay, whoops. Too many pointers. <laughs> okay, a non-invasive ventilator or an EO471. I specifically, when I talk to physicians, I, I spell out the procedure code because so many doctors, they don't understand what we're talking about. They say BiPAP. Gee, okay, get a BiPAP. And then they order EO470. And that machine does not have a backup rate. And so this person who needs ventilation during REM sleep you're just blowing air, and you can blow air all day long, and you're never going to help that person breathe deeper. OK, so they have to have an EL-471. OK, what it does is it rests the respiratory muscles, and it prevents sleep-related progression of respiratory failure. Um, the non-invasive ventilator has become preferred initial therapy for hypoventilation due to respiratory muscle weakness in the neuromuscular patient. Do not use CPAP. Do not use CPAP to treat a neuromuscular patient. Um, I, know I've, I know a lot of my patients are in the, in the crowd here, and we initially met when you were on CPAP. And um, of course, you went through a sleep study. Some of you, it took me a long, long time to get you over to my kind of thinking. Gladys, where are you? It took her two years. It took her two years. <laughs> But I stuck with her. <laughs> she would not get up, give up her CPAP. OK, CPAP does not provide sufficient inspiratory assistance. And CPAP increases the work of breathing. Now think about it. When you inhale, OK, it's going to blow air at you. But when you exhale, how can you exhale against that pressure? Let's say it's pressure of 12. Have you ever tried to breathe against a pressure of 12? We, I always compare it to a dog with his head out the window. Think about that. How would, how would you like that? <laughs> that's, a pretty, that's a pretty good analogy, I think. Okay. I'm 
never going to get this straight. <laughs> okay. Oxygen should not be used with hypoxemia and hypoventilation. Thank you, Dr. Benda. You did a very good job of this. I can't say this enough. If you don't take anything else away from this seminar, please, please do not let them give you vitamin O. Okay. Um, basically, Dr. Bennett talked about how its, manifest, how its manifestations occur during hypoventilation. Oxygen should only be used when there's a comorbidity, like COPD, cardiac problems, or lung disease with pneumonia. Vitamin O is not for everybody. You know, when you, get, when you call the ambulance or you call 911, the first thing they do is they slap on that vitamin O. And I think Dr. Bennett's correct. I think you should be carrying a card like you have when you're a diabetic, you have those little bracelets or you have those little things on your neck that you wear. I kind of think that might be a good thing for you to invest in. Okay. Um, intercostal and accessory muscles are used to as assist a weak diaphragm. Um, basically, when you are in REM sleep, they become flaccid and they do not assist your diaphragm. I'm going to say this over and over and over again because we need them to help us during REM sleep. How do you test somebody for hypoventilation syndrome? Sleep studies are not needed. None of the insurance companies go for a sleep study. None of them. They don't, they don't care about sleep studies. And it's very expensive, like Dr. Bennett said. They're very expensive to go through. You need a diagnosis, first of all, of a neuromuscular disease, any diagnosis. Um, I don't care if it's um, uh, progressive neuromuscular, they don't give you a name, but if they say progressive neuromuscular disorder of some kind, but they can't pin it down, that's good enough. Only one of the following is needed for reimbursement for non-invasive ventilation. You have to have a forced vital capacity of less than 50% of predicted for your height, your weight, and your age, and your sex. Um, a MIP, a maximal inspiratory pressure of less than 60 centimeters of water pressure, or an overnight oximetry of, 80, of less than 88% for at least five minutes. Those are all very, very easy and non-invasively can be obtained. Here's some symptoms I'm going to go. <laughs> Dr. Benden and I look like we went to the same school. Symptoms of, of suggest, that would suggest difficulties with breathing often occur during the night at first because patients with muscle weakness frequently have lower force vital capacities when lying down. Remember we said when we lie a person down, the, the, because of the gravity and also the weight of our internal organs, we are at a disadvantage, about a 30% disadvantage. REM sleep. Okay, the first evidence of respiratory muscle weakness occurs at night, of course. There's, there's five stages of sleep. Number one is when you just lay down, you're just resting, and you may have your eyes closed. Number two is when you're kind of drifting off, but if a dog would bark, or if a cat would come jump on your bed, you'd wake up. That's just the, that's the uh, very, that's very light sleep. And that's not sleep that we want to get into. We want to get into stage three, four, and five. And five happens to be REM. Basically, when you're in those, those nice, productive parts of sleep, what happens is that a lot of things, <laughs> Think of yourself as a, as a computer, and you're, you're putting your things back into the drawer, like closing down your systems in your computer. That's what happens to us during REM sleep and during stage three and stage four. It's the productive part of sleep. Um, and remember I said during REM sleep, the accessory muscles become flaccid, and they cannot help the diaphragm. Patients with neuromuscular disease are more likely having breathing difficulties because of muscle weakness. They do, not, they do not have additional lung problems. They don't have lung problems. They have a ventilator problem. They have a problem with the muscles that move the air in and out. There's nothing wrong with their lungs. If you can think of the lungs as a balloon, all you have to do is inflate them. And once they're inflated, then you can get the air in and into the bloodstream. Once, once, like it says, once the lungs are inflated, the body is able to extract oxygen from the air without difficulty. So if you can think of a, of a balloon, think of a neuromuscular patient. If they can't fill those lungs up with air, they're not going to be ventilated. OK, testing for hypoventilation. Um, the gold standard, as everybody says, is the force vital capacity. OK, that's the, the amount of air that you, 
that has moved during full inspiration. Okay, you have the patient take a maximal inhalation, and then you have them exhale as fast as he can and as forcefully as he can until all the air is gone. This is the hardest part of all the testing that we do for our neuromuscular patients, so I usually do it first. Um, I don't think it's the gold standard. It's just that I was told that. Um, I am sure from years and years of, of working with neuromuscular patients that the MIP is much more of a gold standard. Okay, force file capacity, always use a full face mask because the mouthpiece or a mouthpiece with a nasal, with a nose clip. But remember, a lot of neuromuscular patients, especially with ALS, they can't close their lips or they'll leak out the side and you get a false reading. Um, here, here's how I instruct the patients. I tell them to breathe out normally to full expiration, take in a maximal effort, and then exhale as forcefully and rapidly as possible. And just keep on blowing out until all the air is gone. The force file capacity is the volume of air that is expelled that you're trying to measure. Okay, the force file capacity, I call it a diaphragmatic stress test. Okay. Supine versus upright. Remember I told you when you're lying down, you're at a 30% disadvantage at least. Um, this is the ideal way to do it is supine. A lot of times though in the clinic um, that I help out at, um, that is not, we aren't able to do that because if a person will come in with a chair, like you people in the chairs up there, I would never take you out of your chairs and put you out of bed because of liability. Uh, unless you were home and you're in your own bed. Um, upright force file capacity may not reveal abnormalities that otherwise become noticeable in the supine position. I want you to remember that too. Um, the person may have a, a good force file capacity when they're sitting or standing, but when they lay them down, they, they flunk. They are less than 50% of predicted. Um, the diaphragm becomes weak well before the upright force file capacity is reduced. Remember that. You, they, you could have a lot of respiratory problems before you're going to have a force file capacity of less than 50%. Here we go. This is how not to do a force file capacity. This is how uh, a lab, uh, this is not a full, this is not a full-fledged force file capacity, but this is one that's done most often in physicians' offices or in clinics. And that's not how you do it. Does anybody know why? Good, you got it. Oops, that's too big. How to make that smaller? Anyway, this is how you do it. The per that's a patient lying there. And that's a full face mask around the nose and the mouth. And that's a manometer uh, that is uh, computerized that, that reads the air that's exhaled through that mask. That's what it looks like right there. It's, it's a little manometer. There's different kinds. This one just happens to interface with a software program that we have so we can print it out. Here's, here's the one that I think is the most telling. If, if a person is really, really tired and they can't do a force file capacity, they, are, they certainly can generate a MIP. Okay, basically a MIP is a maximal inspiratory pressure. That measures the strength of the respiratory muscles. It, it actually allows me to see what's, uh, how, how good of ventilation they, are, they, are, they have. It shows the amount of pressure the subject can generate in deep inspiration. That's, or in deep expiration, that's, that's the MEP, okay? So we're, we are only interested in the MIP, but sometimes to get them to do a really good MIP, you have to do a MEP, uh, an expiratory maneuver. So sometimes I'll say to them, okay, can you exhale as hard as you can, and then suck in, draw in as hard as you can. And that usually will get the patient doing it, what I want them to do. Um, here we go. Place the patient in a supine position again if you can. Um, have them inhale and exhale like I told you before uh, through the manometer and have the, uh, the mouthpiece with a nose clip if the patient can handle a mouthpiece, or usually I use a full face mask, so I, I'm sure I've gotten a good reading. There you go, That's, there's a manometer that we use, right over here. Now, we've got some new ones now that have uh, a little red dial on the, on the end of it, and um, uh, Newport Medical has these, but if you get a manometer, make sure you get the one that has a little red dial on it, so you can, it's a little stationary red dial, and basically when, when they inhale, this manometer will go up, and the little red dial will stay right as far as they went, so you can read it much better. 
But see, it's very easy to, to attach a, a plate on a full face mask and have the patient perform the maneuver. There's another one. There's where the dial is going up. It's really hard. To, to me, when you have a, a diagnosis of neuromuscular disease, it's very hard to get a MIP of more than minus 60. Uh, so it's a very easy test that the patient can qualify for his non-invasive ventilation. Okay, normal values. Anybody that has a MIP of greater than 60 centimeters of water pressure or a maximal expiratory pressure of greater than 120 centimeters of water pressure, that's a lot to generate. And most people with neuromuscular, even post-polio patients that supposedly don't have any respiratory problems, um, cannot generate a pot more, than pot more than 60 centimeters of water pressure. Um, I want you to know that in pulmonary function labs, they do not routinely perform a MIP or a MEP. So when you, you hear somebody say, oh, I have my pulmonary functions done, they don't do MIPs or MEPs in a, in a lab. That's something that has to be done by a, 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 somebody that understands what's going on with the, your muscles because of your disease. A sniff. Now, a sniff is just exactly what it sounds like. You're going to have that patient sniff, okay? It's performed and the patient cannot perform a MIP. Usually that'll be an ALS patient or somebody with bulbar involvement. These muscles here, they can't close them so they can give you a real good maximum inspiratory pressure. It, it also measures the strength of the respiratory muscles and allows for the assessment of ventilatory failure. If they can't do a MIP, this is when we do a sniff test. Now here's, here's what a sniff test looks like. You actually take this um, a little device and you have to put it in their nose and then you block off the other nares with your, with your finger glove. And here you can see where that red dial is there. That's the, the stationary dial that will stay there once the manometer goes back to zero. And so you can actually get a good reading uh, on these. Now you can buy a fancy one that will cost you about $1,500. Um, but this one here you can make up very easily. You can get those parts from Newport Medical. And there's uh, your part numbers right there. If you'd like to write them down, I'll leave this up for a while. Um, I looked for the longest time for a sniff device because of the clinic at ALS. A lot of our patients have bulbar involvement and they could not do a MIP. So um, people at Anesthesia Associates who sell through Newport Medical uh, help me make up this manometer. And then uh, down here, the nasal probes come from MicroDirect, the little blue nasal probe that I put into the, the patient's nose. And that's the part number there, if you can read it. Um, I have one of these out uh, in the uh, outer room to show you if you want to see it, if some of your therapists would like to look at it, see how it's put together. And it costs about 200 bucks. It's, you can't beat it. I mean, there's no form of, of reimbursement for this type of testing. And yet somebody has to do it. And we try to find ways of doing it as inexpensively as we can, but as accurately as we can. OK, overnight oximetry. This is what uh, an ox, uh, a finger probe looks like. Um, it's done in the home. Uh, basically, uh, you have the patient take the oximeter home, puts on this little probe, and then he just sleeps with it overnight. And what will happen is it'll, it'll keep uh, track of his oxygen level all through the night, and it can be downloaded, and we can see what's going on. In order to qualify for non-invasive ventilation, you have to have an oxygen saturation of less than 88% for more than five minutes. The recording time has to be at least two hours, and you have to be on your prescribed oxygen level. So if, you, if doctor says you have to be on two liters of oxygen, then you have to sleep with your oxygen on. Okay, this is interesting. I, in my research, I, I thought it was so interesting. Up in San Francisco at the uh, MDA ALS clinic, this was, it just reinforced what I was, was seeing. They found no case in which the force vital capacity was greater than 50% and it occurred earlier than the MIP being less than 60. Does everybody understand that? In other words, the force vital capacity was never lower before the MIP. So that's why I say the MIP should be the gold standard. Um, over time, the data showed that patients reached the MIP criteria four to six, excuse me, four to six, ooh, four to six months earlier than the force vital capacity. Now that, remember, that's ALS. That's not post-polio or some of the other 
but ALS patients, they took them four to six months for their MIP to show up. Uh, anyway, that little mucociliary clearance depends on our cough strength to get that stuff, to, that, the little hairs with their waving motion to get that, the secretions up. This, again, peak cough flow is not routinely measured in most uh, PFT centers or in most centers. You need somebody there that really understands what a peak cough flow needs to be. Um, this is performed with a peak flow meter where they're really inexpensive and then you, put, you attach a, a, a mass to it. It's, it. They're very simple to do. You have the patient taking a big breath and have them forcefully blast out. It's almost like a spit. In other words, when you see this peak cough flow, let's see if I can find it here, right there. This little thing here, okay, it starts down here at zero. And if you don't go pretty fast, it's not going to move that little thing. If, you have, if the patient goes where is it going to go? It's not going to go anyplace. So you need to make that person actually blow all their air out in one forceful effort, almost like a spit. And again, it's done with the patient in the, lying on the, on the pillow or on the flat bed, however they sleep at night. One thing I say when I'm uh, testing these people and they're lying on, in bed, I always tell them, if your head comes off that pillow, you flunked. You have to do it all over again. So that's something you watch for when you're doing these tests because they really, most patients want to do well, and so they'll really perform for you, and their head comes right off that pillow, and I say, okay, you just flunked. Okay, when do you start non-invasive ventilation? Okay, uh, we like to do it earlier, even earlier than when these tests show, because basically um, the RAD policy, everybody knows what the RAD policy is, that, that was invented by CMS, Medicare, and most of the insurances uh, follow that policy. They say that you have to have a forced vital capacity of less than 50%, or a MIP of minus 60 centimeters of water pressure, uh, or a CO2 higher than 45 millimeters, or a sleep, sleep oximetry where the oxygen level is less than 88% for at least five minutes. Well, if you wait that long, a lot of times people um, have a hard time acclimating to non-invasive ventilation or to any mask therapy. So I like to get them going as early as I can, and we try to flunk them early. Supplemental oxygen, oh boy, here we go again. Now I hope you take this away too. Here, common response to breathing is vitamin O. Um, anytime uh, 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 the ambulance comes to get somebody, the first thing you see them slap on is oxygen. And like we said, it could be the worst thing that you're doing for that patient because Dr. Bennett explained what happens when you put on supplemental oxygen on patients that are hypoventilating, that are not breathing deeply. This carbon dioxide goes up. Yes, the oxygen goes, goes up also, but we don't want the carbon dioxide to go up. That's the poison stuff that we exhale every day. Uh-oh, who's that? I know you know who that is. <laughs> That's Sleepy. Remember the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? I have more fun with these. Uh, I, if you've seen this speech before, please bear with me, but it's kind of cute. This is Sleepy. Okay, he's the dwarf that feels most like the PPS community. Perpetually yawning, perpetually sleepy looking, and heavily lit expression. He looks just like you guys do, without therapy. <laughs> now there's Snow White. Everybody knows who she is, right? Okay, now, who can name the seven dwarfs? Two Ds. Yay. Two Ss. Sleepy. Yep, three emotions. You guys, you, you passed. Okay, here's our names, Doc and Dopey, Sleepy and Sneezy, Bashful, Grumpy, and Happy. Who's that? Yay! Dopey. And Happy. Okay, questions and answers, and thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> oh, and these people are some of my wonderful compadres that help me measure force file capacity, MIP, and overnight symmetry. Okay. Yes, Would, are you saying that every polio survivor has respiratory muscle weakness? No. 
No. Does every polio survivor with PPS have respiratory muscle no. thickness? If you had a polio survivor with PPS, 50, late 50s and obese, and not, no evidence of any respiratory muscle weakness, is it totally inappropriate for them to have a CPAP for a short of street sleep apnea? I'd probably like to see you on a bi-level. Is there a danger for that person if, he, if he has no respiratory muscle weakness? Well, you may not have it at the time of your study, but remember we talked about having you restudy every year, but mm -hmm. nobody's doing that because there's no form of payment, and where are you going to go? But doesn't, if you're using the BiPAP, don't you, in, in essence, uh, not get the, mus the lung muscles to work as hard as they should? Oh, wait, wait. Even though by, by having someone that does, doesn't, doesn't have muscle weakness, merely has obstructive sleep apnea, uh, it, it, by using the BiPAP, aren't you, in a way, using a little more than they need? I don't think so. I think it's safer to, be, to err on the safe side than it is to err on the, on, 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 I'm just giving them CPAP. If, if I know you have a diagnosis of neuromuscular disease and you've had a sleep study, and it shows that there is no, I mean, that you've got obstructive sleep apnea, Okay, then I will go to your doctor. I will ask him for an order to evaluate you with peak, uh, with, I'm sorry, forced lung capacity, MIP, and, forced, and peak cough flow. I will ask for that uh, uh, prescription. And then I'll ask you into my office. I'll, che I'll check you with those three parameters. And if you have any kind of weakness at all, I'm going to suggest to the doctor that he puts you on bi-level. But they didn't measure your MIP. They no, but I'm saying, let's, <laughs> let's say we know that. Okay. Yes, I would. Yes. That varies a little bit, I would say. You know, I mean, I, and I respect your opinion on that. The, um, if, if you're, oh, sorry, being recorded. Thanks. I was just going to say, I uh, respect Helen's opinion on that. I think if you were to ask, you know, a whole group of people in that, you'd get varied opinions on mm -hmm. that. Um, if you had absolutely bang on normal function, so your, your MIP was fine, your vital capacity was fine, and then you had a sleep study and it was classic, you know, obstructive sleep apnea, I, I think you could reasonably be on CPAP for that. I do believe, and I agree with you, that one thing that happens is somebody gets put on CPAP and then they may have progression of muscle weakness later and it never gets changed. And that's the worry that all of us mm -hmm. have. I would say the most common problem that I see is that people who have muscle weakness, who actually need the bi-level you know, device, are put on CPAP. I mean, the sleep labs, it is really common. Right. And, and I would agree that kind of pseudo-obstructive event that she showed, they interpret that as obstruction. They put them on CPAP. That's the end of it, and then they're not adequately treated. But, but anyway. Can we hear from the sleep lab people, please? They have a question. I'd like to hear from. I'd like to help. Give us an answer. So it's coming. It's Wait, coming right it's here. coming. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize that you've run into such bad doctors and sleep labs. Um, we work closely at Alvarado Hospital with the Neuromuscular Comebackers Club, and we do about 70% of the neuromuscular people. Bi-level people leave with bi-level. That, what you saw on the screen with an overall SAO2 drop in REM, is called a central hypopnea. In our lab, we do not see that as something that you throw CPAP at. We see that as something that you throw bi-level at because it occurs in REM. Once you have titrated somebody in C with CPAP and they've responded properly in non-REM and we see that in REM, it is automatic protocol for us to switch over to bi-level. And again, I'd like to apologize that nobody else has done that for you, your patients. Can I ask you, when you say bi-level, do you mean EO470 or EO471? I don't know those numbers. Okay, That's not something one, that I'm familiar with. My job is to, to use okay, CPAP or bi-level, bi -level, which are the machines that are offered to me. Bi-level S means it just has an upper level and a lower level. That's what we have. Okay. When you do non-invasive ventilation, that's a bi-level also. Upper level and lower level, but it has a backup rate. 
that we, would be have, more appropriate for these patients. For yeah. people with respironics, when we have, we have both ResMed and respironics in our lab, and I don't know what the number difference is or how, they, how you classify them um, for you guys, but I know that ResMed does not give us um, access to a backup rate and respironics does. They give us access to um, a backup rate of, of tidal volume, many, many of, I mean, it's really, really in depth with respironics. I'm, I'm not trying to dog ResMed because I'm a huge fan. I'm just saying that we do have that capacity and we, and we do, we are trained for that because our director has a 15 year respiratory background. So who, what, what machine do you put these people on when you, when you see that? When we come, when we, when they come in and we know that they're from neuromuscular, we know that they're from the spinal center or anything like that. Immediately, you put them in the room with the respironics that we can control their so tidal that's, volume. That's and the backup the, rate. Good. That we can control all of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, just um, one more question. I'm just curious. You test every in, in the office. You do all the the MIPs and stuff like if that. If we have a physician's order. And then, how is it that you titrate them to bi level? Um, we have an order from the physician. Titrate to effective therapy with parameters. In other words, the, the I will be between 8 to 12 or greater. But we have that little note that says titrate to effective therapy. Um, and then also on the EPAP, we start at 4, 4 to 8, depending on. Um, all the machines now are so smart in that we send them home with the little cards. So they'll go overnight. We'll talk to them the next day. And we'll give them at least two nights at home, and then they either have to send that card into us or bring the machine in, because that's how we know what's going on. That's how we titrate our patients. But we first have that little note that says titrate to effective therapy. Thank you. I got a question here. Uh, we're, pick, we're picking up our CPAP, sleep study, obstructive apnea, you know, just like classic what you said. We're picking it up on Tuesday. But Obviously, during the sleep study, um, the episode as a caregiver that I'm concerned about didn't didn't happen. You know, where um, the patient is waking up and is <laughs> totally the throat's totally closed off for like I mean almost a minute, and this didn't happen during the sleep study. So again, my concern: Are we getting the right machine? Is, is even with this machine, is it going to happen again? I I don't know what your diagnosis. Are. I I don't know. Right. What to say? If, I, I can't answer that. Okay. Can Can you help him? Uh, I think the, um, so. Um, that's one reason that for the neuromuscular patients that we go much more on the. Uh, mm -hmm the clinical measurements mm -hmm. rather than the sleep study yeah. because it may not be that they've gotten the same sleep that they would get at home. Mm -hmm. So I would say if an individual qualifies on other criteria, um, we use that because um, that's an issue. Did, did the sleep lab pick it up um, and did they sleep like they would normally? So that's a kind of a general answer. Um. I, I, I'm a little puzzled because if you have problems with expiration, why have any pressure when you're breathing out? Why have four? Diana can answer that very easily. Go ahead, Diana. Okay, the, the bi-level machines are, are uh, designed to work with a continuous flow of air, and you literally can't turn it up turn the expiratory pressure up. By the way, it was a very good question, very astute. You can't, you can't make it anything less than four, uh, and four is, is minimal. It also helps keep the airway open. There is an alternative. In some cases, you may want to have volume ventilators, whereby you can have a, a, a zero expiratory pressure, because what, in that case, what you're doing is you're dialing a particular volume in, and, uh, and there's an exhalation valve that, that opens during inhalation and it closes during exhalation, and you have no expiratory pressure. Um, I, I also, the gentleman that asked about getting an uh, overnight oximetry, uh, oximeter with the software, is he shouldn't really have, he really should not have to buy that. 
um, because there's a, you should be able to make arrangements with your home care company to have overnight oximetry. And there are, there are companies that specifically will uh, do the downloads and give you the results. You shouldn't have to go to that expense. Helen? Uh, the reason that you have to have the expiratory pressure of at least four is that uh, the way the machines are designed, when you exhale, you breathe carbon dioxide into the tubing, and the four centimeters flushes the carbon dioxide out of the tubing. So that, that's an, it's necessary. Helen, I've had, I'm right here. I've had two sleep studies, and both of them were worthless oh. because there was absolutely no feedback on it. Your company, uh, within a few minutes in our post-polio meeting, was able to diagnose uh, my problems, and you put me on a BiPAP, and uh, since then I have... Uh, a different BiPAP than you offered by another company, but uh, be that as it may, uh, CPAPs, we keep talking about CPAPs, and it seems to me that that's the only thing a doctor knows is CPAPs, and unfortunately, that's what they were taught in medical school, that if you have a problem with a patient, you put them on a CPAP. CPAP almost killed me when I was in a hospital. <coughs> Can I say one thing? We don't diagnose. <laughs> we, don't, we, we probably tested you, but we did not diagnose you, okay? We tested you. Okay, thank you. We have time for question. one more question. Right here. Thank you very much for informative, uh, um, whatever you said as far as the respiratory therapists are. I'm right here. <laughs> Right here. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm from Northern California, and my experience with respir respiratory therapists and actually the breeding doctors was not as good as everybody else. I uh, actually I had to be my own advocate and tell the doctor maybe I need a machine, maybe I need to be tested lying down. How come you're not telling me you're not helping me? Many many times going to the doctors, and from my experience, the problem I found. The respiratory therapists, they have no clue what post-polio issues are. And my question is, what is the education of a respiratory therapist and how often they go back to school to learn what else is new and what other new patients and new devices out there? The only uh, thing I found out from certain respiratory therapists that are representing certain companies, not necessarily yours, was basically they wanted to know what size machine I need to know all those devices and how often they can supply me and what insurance I have and what they can sell me that doesn't cost them anything and you know maximize whatever that I have to pay through my insurance. So the whole thing was basically not helping me. I have a collection of a BiPAP and CPAP and different tubes and nasal pillows and facial masks and I don't use any of them. I'm and sorry. I'm still having issues. I'm sorry you're having those problems. Um, when did you have your sleep study? I had the sleep study in 2004, okay. and I was prescribed the CPAP, and which then, I could not use, and I went back and forth with my respiratory therapist, and thinking, oh, I can't use it, I can't breathe it, keep telling me, oh, keep using it, you get used to it. You're not giving it enough chance. And, you know, how often do you have to choke and try to die and, and then give it a chance? I mean, I didn't understand. I had to die before they change it. So I just stopped using it, and I let it go. I sleep in a sitting position. I have other issues. You know, post-polio people have a lot of issues. It's not just breathing. And sleeping in a certain position magnifies those issues. And now it's 2010, but at 2008, I had another sleep study with the same physician that may be a little bit more sympathetic that I have lost some weight. I have done a lot of positive things for supposedly getting rid of this sleep apnea. So I can talk, in, talk him into, okay, I do not have an obstructive sleep apnea only. I have maybe something else, central sleep apnea. Can you do something else for me? With my push, put in touch with another sleep study. The sleep study was not done um, the way that I could have gotten the benefit. And the other uh, pulmonary um, tests were only done sitting. And I knew if I could not 
push that much air in that machine if I was lying down. And I have my good days and bad days. And after 10 times I push the air, if they have tested me number 15, I would have been, it wasn't the real thing. So with the, they had no clue what post-polio people go through. And they just you know, give you the run of the mill. I just am worried about the education of the respiratory therapists and the help we're getting out there. They're more salespeople than anything else. But, but now that you've been educated, now you know what to ask for. Well, what are you, you going know, to ask for? I am going to ask for, but I think I have to tell everybody, you have to be your own advocate. Oh, you have yeah, to speak yeah. out. I agree with you. I agree with you. And insist, don't take no for an answer. And I'm taking this symposium, hopefully with the help of your company, your people, and other physicians, maybe to Northern California. We have a lot of people can use your help up there. So, well, I'm glad you came down to learn. Thank you. Thank you.